I don't think anyone. Oh, okay. Um, oh, being recorded. All right. Well, there you go. Game on. Um, so, John, are you letting people? Uh, John Michael, are you letting yes. uh, folks in now? Okay. They're just coming in. Terrific. Um, you all great. look a lot more official. I'm, I'm ready with my cocktail and and my flannel, straight for you know the Pacific Northwest. I, I'm prepared. I think I'm the only loser in the group who's still at work. Um, <laughs> So I'm, uh, I'm prepared too, and the sun is shining in Seattle, as you can hopefully see. Beautiful. There. Yeah. Oh, that's a gorgeous view. Uh, okay, fine. If you if you must, so here's my office too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your poster has a lake view on it. So same thing. Uh, there, that's right. I've got a. That's right. I've got a picture of a window or a picture of the outside. No window. I'm more concerned, Jamie, about why you're at work longer than your fellow. Shouldn't Raf be there longer than you? Good point. He just is a, it's just a signifier that he's smarter than I am. <laughs> uh, uh, senioritis, congrats on your job, Raf. That's great news. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I've learned to not linger in the hospital over many, many years as a fellow. <laughs> you know, Jamie, there's many things one can learn from their fellows too, it seems. <laughs> yeah, no, no question about that. Um, so for those of joining just now, any, um, any very astute participants will, um, I guess, probably notice that I am not Marty Leon, or that none of us are Marty Leon. Um, he was uh, meant to run this session, but had a late conflict. So um, we've got an all star panel of um, not Marty Leon's to, uh, to step in and talk uh, tricuspids. And um, I guess I'll just do some quick introductions here. Um, Amar Krishnaswamy in the, in the, in the flannel, uh, rocking the Pacific Northwest, representing the Pacific Northwest, but from Cleveland, is uh, at Cleveland Clinic, an interventional cardiologist. Uh, Dr. Burkhard Mackinson uh, in the sunshine of Seattle, is uh, the chief of anesthesia and our primary invasive imager and, and leader of the imaging program. And Dr. Ra Ferrari, who is, um, is starting a program at NYU um, shortly uh, at, on the Bellevue campus and is uh, currently working with me at UW. And my name is Jamie McCabe, also um, at the University of Washington. So with that out of the way, um, Let's talk a little tricuspids. I was thinking that we should just set the stage a little bit on how do you grade, like how do you grade tricuspids? Who deserves to get a second thought? What like who are the people that we even need to pay attention to? Because uh, obviously, some degree of TR is so commonly found. Um, Burkhart, talk a little bit about echo um, grading of TR, the new criteria, are they valuable? What criteria do you use? Things along those lines. Oh, you're muted. Certainly, i um, happy to. Um, I, I would start with the following. I would start with, there's on the one hand, the guideline, um, you know, grading that, that we all have access to and that may be directed in, in this country or by the American Society of Echocardiography, or it may be, may be uh, suggested by the American Heart Association uh, guideline statements on valvular disease. And what they all have in common for the tricuspid valve is really trying to look at the uh, echocardiographic um, endpoints such as continuous wave Doppler, color Doppler, hepatic venous, flow reversal, um, and things of that nature in order to grade tricuspid regurge. Um, what is more recent is a development that actually really stems from, uh, from the CRF and uh, Rebecca Hahn in, in New York, thinking that the grading from mild to moderate to severe or trace um, is not enough and we need, we need worse than severe. And, and worse could be torrential, could be massive, gigantic, astronomical, I don't know. But uh, it yeah. gets a little bit flowerful. And um, 
while I don't mind that, I would I would agree that there are categories that potentially are not sufficiently described with just severe. And when I think about that myself, I, I think we're not using the third dimension or the fourth dimension if you add time enough. And I keep this brief, but I would say if you think of a vena contractor, which is like the neck of like an hourglass, and but you would cut that and get a diameter and then actually a slice of that, or you think of a salami that you slice, uh, you'd have a a real circumference and an area of that salami. And you could think that is a different measure of the width of the vena contractor, not just the width, but actually the, the diameter and, and the circumference and the perimeter and the area. So if we have a three-dimensional regurgitant jet, we might as well look at that and get a little bit more information about the severity and the extent of the malcooptation uh, for, for a, a different term. Now, how do we measure that? And, and why do I think it makes sense? Uh, well, on the mitral, to come back to that, we've used it over the years quite extensively and actually uh, published in Jack uh, Cardiovascular Intervention that it may make sense to look at a vena contractor area at a baseline uh, at the beginning of a procedure, for instance, and then look at various stages of the procedure to guide us how much further we may need to reduce that vena contractor area in order to have a sufficiently uh, successful result that actually is longer lasting, keeps the patient out of the hospital, prevents them from being hospitalized or, or be feeling sick again. So if we take that to the tricuspid, we've actually looked at the following, which is now we have a lot of information about three-dimensional data, we know we can get several systolic frames of that three-dimensional jet. We might as well look at the information that's that dynamic, and that could be the fourth dimension. And so what we've done, one of our fellows, myself, we've actually looked at various time points of systole, and we found the biggest vena contractor area, meaning the biggest bulk of TR in a, in a secondary or functional TR happens in the first third of systole. So if you're looking for the biggest jet as a baseline assessment, you might as well look in that first third of systole. Obviously in the procedure, we cannot measure all these 20 frames that we get. We have to know a little bit ahead of time. So maybe I stop there and take questions. Well, you know, if I can, if I can ask you to, to clarify a little bit um, for me and uh, for the audience, I would hope, you know, I think three three D vena contracta area is a huh. We all, we all get it. This is just for you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so for, I think one of the pitfalls in measuring three D vena contracta area is that with any three D color measures, right? The the color splays out. The fl uh, flow kind of splays out. And so, what are the sort of the tricks that you use to make sure that you're being as accurate as you can be when you're really trying to understand the TR quantification with that, that's number one. And then number two, I feel like for all of the things that we really sit there and measure and try to grade the TR this way and that way, at least for me, Jamie, just for me, <laughs> that I feel like the very qualitative and subjective view to say, whoa, that looks like pretty bad TR. And I think that RV looks like it's hurting and this patient has leg swelling. I guess we should fix it. You know, like that just seems so much easier. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Maybe I can just share briefly a, a few slides just to have an easier time to get this across. Can you uh, see my yep. image? Yep. Now, if we look at this for one moment, there's a lot of TR, agreed? Yeah. Tons. We also, it's dense and it's continuous throughout systole. It doesn't fade. And you also see that I used the 3D data set, which is in the right lower corner, and used a multiplanar arrangement to kind of cut through what I think is the vena contracta. That should be the narrowest portion of the neck in the right upper in that red frame. And obviously, we have some issues in kind of optimizing the blue plane in the left upper image. But 
what we get with this alignment is a directional flow and a perpendicular cutting plane that quite accurately in my mind gets the thickness of that of that slice that footprint that i refer to and if i now were to freeze that image in in a systolic frame i can trace it in the in the left lower short axis now i i would admit that uh, this is not always as clear cut as in this example because we have dropout or we have poor imaging, we have catheters. But you see, for instance, here there is a pacemaker lead that is quite mobile, moving in and out of plane. It's not disturbing the color 3D assessment as much. This color data set has about 60 frames, which five years ago, 60 frames, um, meaning 60 hertz. So it's a very high volumetric data. It runs well and has a lot of information. Five years ago, we didn't, we didn't even know that we could get these high volume rate 3D images. Now, um, I think it's undoubtedly providing a lot of certainty about the severity of MR, uh, TR here. Just to take it to that other point that I made, this is that the data set that we used, I think this was 11 or 12 patients that some of them had up to 20 frames of systolic TR that, that we could measure. And, and here you see the spread of the data and, and the bulk of the, the, the largest vena contractor areas happened in the first phase of systole. That's kind of what that's indicating. Um, but you see, it's a, it's a lot of data points that we kind of rely on. We did not publish this as a manuscript at this point, but it's some work that um, we presented last year um, as an abstract. So I think it's informative. And back to your question in terms of certainty, um, I get your point. Uh, this is again, not in the guidelines, but it actually for the mitral valve has appeared in the American Heart Guideline that guides the assessment of post-intervention mitral assessment. So I think the, there, there's a headway, there's, there's support to include as an extra data point. And I don't wanna, don't want to distract from the fact that if we go by the book right now, we, we adhere to guidelines to assess severity, we should go by the established data points. And, and the vena contractor area is not quite there at this point because it hasn't been calibrated to angiography and other severity measures. Uh, MRI would be an alternative uh, to really calibrate it to and, and, and have additional certainty. If I can take a, a cynical uh, approach to Amr's question, I think the the one of just the core element here of creating more categories than just severe was that it really sucked for people to write tricuspid clip done pre TR severe post TR severe. <laughs> it felt so much better to just say pre TR massive, like crazy <laughs> massive, post TR just severe. <laughs> and that felt a lot better. And the vena contracta area, you know, I will say that it probably isn't something that's routinely done in screening for do you move forward or not. But at least in our lab with, with Burkhart running the show, has been a really nice way to estimate effect size, right? That it is getting a pre and post vena contracta area does give you some sense sense because if you if you're going to pressurize the jet and the color flow might continue to look sort of robust if the vena contracta area really goes down you know we believe that that might show something so i think it is along the same lines as creating the massive and the super massive and the godzilla massive is just so that you know you have it less about screening for should we do something and more, more about did we do something um, after therapy. Um, yeah. Yes, no, I, I, I get your point, uh, Jamie. I would push back slightly saying that besides the, the, the feel that it's better to reduce from torrential to severe, there's also to, there's some evidence to, to think that if you actually do that and you have this category that maybe is not even on the slide and beyond that, that if you bring them back to moderate to severe, you do potentially see a functional improvement. 
Yeah. And I, I think that 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 helps to 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 think about justifying it. Yeah, yeah. And you're you're right. I was being too cynical, but it because we we I mean Amr, I don't know, are you seeing folks where there's I know you have some cases in the wings. Maybe let's jump into a case since this is since this is case over cocktails, and we'll use that as a jumping off point. But I do want you to talk a little bit about um, you know whether or not you're seeing patient response that's discordant from the echocardiographic results and so sure. forth. Um, no, that would be great. And um, it looks like I would love to share a case, Jamie, but it looks like you've disabled my screen sharing. Oh, yes, we had a meeting. Um, you've, uh... <laughs> I have nothing, I have nothing troubling to share, I promise. Okay. Um, no, I, you know, I, I think to answer your, your question before we get into the case, um, you know, I, I think on both, honestly, the mitral and the tricuspid sides, I think I've been pleasantly surprised, especially when we have, you know, sort of the functional MR kind of patients. And I'm not, you know, aesthetically pleased by the MR result, but, you know, the, like by the echo, but maybe the pulmonary veins were reversed or blunted and now they look better. Uh, LA pressure with direct measurement looks better. You know, I think I've been placing my faith more on, on those in terms of clinical response than necessarily how the MR looks, especially in that patient whose, you know, entire valve doesn't co-opt because of apical tethering. And so sort of translated then to the tricuspid side, you know, it, it is such a load dependent uh, phenomenon, right? And so what we have taken to doing is we bring our patients usually a few days beforehand, you know, before planned tricuspid clipping and just to diurese them and know that we're in a good volume status, it makes it technically easier to clip the leaflets. And then between the you know, the few hours the procedure takes and all the volume they're getting in either from the anesthesia team and the mitra clip system, et cetera, by the next morning, their echo looks worse because they've gotten all this, all this volume, but, you know, they feel like a million bucks. And so I agree. I think, you know, uh, Burkhardt, I think it's a really nice kind of systolic phase analysis that you did. And I think trying to help us understand how to, how to better understand the degree of, of TR is going to be really important moving ahead. Um, so um, we'll start um, with a case here. Certainly, please uh, feel free to, to kind of interrupt or ask questions or, or what have you. Um, this is a 78-year-old lady uh, with typical risk factors, bypass surgery, renal artery stenting, some CKD, uh, and a pacemaker, which of course will become uh, relevant. <clears throat> and um, she had exertional fatigue, lower extremity edema and weakness actually because her legs were getting so swollen. And you can appreciate here that while the right ventricular function seems reasonably preserved, uh, it is at least sort of moderately dilated. You can see the right atrial and ventricular leads in place there. And as a result, uh, quite uh, torrential, massive kind of tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, and as you can see on at least this representative TEE image, uh, it really seems to involve uh, the tricuspid, or sorry, the pacemaker lead passing through the tricuspid, as you can appreciate there uh, as it flashes through the images. Um, if you look at this, here's a, a gastric image. You can appreciate that the tricuspid lead uh, is kind of going through the central coaptation. And then in the color, there's really you know, significant regurgitation both behind the lead, so kind of between posterior and septal, and also in front of the lead, kind of between anterior and septal. Perhaps posterior is a bit more, but certainly leaks a lot throughout that coaptation. Um, and I think that you know, really to, to highlight, as, as Burkhardt did, the understanding that we get from 3D multiplanar reconstruction, both in the kind of analysis and pre-procedural phases, as well as uh, the actual procedure, you know, just seeing that lead sitting there and a ton of tricuspid regurgitation all over, I think, uh, makes it less clear that this is a technically feasible procedure. But this is, I think, a very, very educational, just one box of images here. If you look at the bottom left and you see that green imaging plane is uh, passing between the septal and anterior leaflets, and then move up to the left box there, you see very nicely that the, the leaflets come together quite well to grasp just sitting in front of the 
pacemaker lead bouncing around, which is marked by the arrow. And then if you look at the red plane, which is then passing through the septal and posterior leaflets, again, just behind the pacemaker lead, again, really nice uh, graspable leaflets. Uh, and so I think, again, un uh, the understanding that we get from 3D MPR, uh, at least to me these days with our imaging colleagues providing these kind of images is, is way superior to anything we were getting from 2D and even sort of routine 3D kind of imaging. Um, just to get everyone uh, kind of in the same page, if, if you're not uh, familiar with the clips that are currently available, uh, there's the NT clip, which is the sort of uh, godfather of the clips. And now we have an NT both in a regular narrow version and a wider version. And the XT clip, which has about three millimeters longer of grasping surface in both narrow and wider versions. Uh, and this G4 uh, system, I might add, also provides an independent grasping mechanism where we can grasp each of the leaflets separately. Now the plan for this patient is uh, actually one that we treated um, uh, with uh, part of the Triluminate trial. Uh, and so uh, while the Triluminate trial as of now has a G4 clip available, at this time that was not available. So we just had the sort of simultaneous grasping uh, NT and XT clips. So our plan was to place an XT clip at the septal and anterior leaflets. And then uh, once we grasp that to then move posteriorly so that the anterior clip didn't shadow us out and then place another clip to the septal and posterior uh, leaflets. So you can see here, uh, the first clip uh, oriented, uh, again, looking at the green box, uh, the 3D box in the bottom right uh, to the septal and anterior leaflets. You see that nicely kind of spanning the leaflets there in the, in the top. You can see here uh, this clip, sorry, uh, it's not really playing. My home internet, I guess, is not great, but it's possible that my family is watching streaming video right now upstairs. I don't know. <laughs> you can see- I can actually clip. say, if I may interrupt, I think at times Please. it's really important to slow down our images. I, I, and I really mean it because uh, sometimes these things just move too quick and, and here you start seeing the engagement of the leaflets with the clip um, in the slowed down uh, version. Um, one quick question I have, if I may. Um, Please. Do you, um, do you ask for your imaging colleagues to rotate the, the 3D image at the bottom so that, that you know what's up and what's down or do you mostly work with the 2D images that are resulting? No, it's uh, our, our 3D, uh, our imagers are very kind in that they try to make it as easy and straightforward uh, for me as possible. And so keeping it in this anatomic kind of atrial view uh, really helps me to understand the orientation. And especially, you know, we've, we've been using the glass view more often. So now even when we get down into the ventricle, whether it's on the mitral side or the tricuspid side, uh, we can see the orientation in the glass view in the 3D so that I know we've not turned or anything like that. So that's been really helpful. There was only one true answer there and you nailed that one. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> I, I always ask Burghardt to do that for me too. Um, but apparently there are, some, there are some labs that hold firm to the idea that you're just supposed to look at it upside down and, and get it, but my brain can't do that. You know, I think for the audience, uh, go ahead. You know, Burke, I was just saying, we recently had a paper rejected where, where the, one of the reviewers actually stated they don't know, they could not imagine why 3D MPR Live had any possible benefit over the current imaging that exists. And therefore the paper was totally irrelevant. That's incredible. Um, I think for the audience, it's really important to just find out what works for your team and be clear on, on the uh, imaging uh, display so that everybody truly is on the same view and the same page in, in communication. So as, uh, as you would have seen if the clip was playing, the clip, the uh, mitre clip was kind of favoring the uh, septal leaflet. So we just kind of added some minus to the, uh, to the system in order to <clears throat> favor a bit more to the anterior side of things. And I think as you can, uh, I'll play this again, hopefully you'll be able to appreciate that we've now nicely spanned both of these leaflets in order to, uh, in order to grasp them. I do find it uh, very helpful uh, to have the fluoro and, and we have the luxury of a biplane uh, fluoro in our hybrid room. 
Uh, and so I think especially when we're dealing with clipping tricuspid valve leaflets, when there's a pacemaker involved, this really helps out uh, to make sure we're avoiding the pacemaker leads. Uh, and then just to orient kind of on the right, the LAO screen there to understand the, how the tricuspid leaflets orient. So you can see here now with the first clip in place, those leaflets are kind of nicely grabbed. And uh, so we went ahead then to, to move on with a second clip as planned, oriented to the posterior and septal uh, leaflets. Again, you can see here um, that if you, um, if you look at the fluoroscopic image, we're clearly oriented to septal and posterior as pointed out there. Um, and what you can see here, and, and this again, I think speaks per part to this your is point. Wonky, but how, sorry, Amar, how do you, what's this, your strategy for getting down to the posterior side? You are using the triluminate device, I guess. So maybe that's part of it, but. Um, it is, so I'll tell you, we've done, um, for various reasons, we've done a lot more clipping with the mitral clip uh, after clipping tricuspid leaflet, uh, mitral leaflets than with the triluminate system itself. And so yep. what we do with the, with the mitral clip system is, I know a lot of the kind of the book chapters and review articles out there have you counterclockwise uh, key in 90 degrees. And then the, frankly, I find the buttonology gets a little bit wonky there and using the A knob to bend it down and stuff. And so we actually transitioned kind of early on to actually clockwise keying it by 90 degrees. And the benefit of that is that you're just used to using the M knob to bend the clip down to get where you want, right? So when you clockwise it by 90 degrees, you again, just start using the M knob again, like you do on the mitral side. Mm. And so then it becomes a very, I mean, in, in the most basic of terms, you're just putting M to bend it down more or less. Mm -hmm. And then you're going kind of clockwise on the front guide catheter to go more toward the septum or counterclockwise to come towards the anterior posterior leaflet. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to, if you have kind of a septal hugger or something like that, add yourself a little bit of minus to kind of uh, give yourself a little bit more height and then bend down more. So I think that's, again, highly basic and much easier to say than when you're actually in the OR and those buttons don't work like they should, but. Uh, well, just to confuse matters, worse, matters worse, we key it in 180 degrees. Um, and so then you don't have to worry about clock or counterclock because they both end up in the same spot. And then, uh, and then use a knob to come down um, for your flex where okay. less A is more anterior septal commissure and more A is more posterior septal commissure. Um, gotcha. Doesn't work as well if you want to go anterior, like the anterior posterior, which is essentially going, would be the equivalent of going more medial in a mitral clip, but in a tricuspid is going more lateral, you know, away from okay. the septum, um, is, is the, I think, where I struggle a little bit um, to sort of guide things, but. Um, Did you try the 90 degree clock and you didn't like it and then iterate it to the 180? Nope. Just always have done 180. I think, um, you know, just I think as everyone, right, we end up clipping much more sort of anterior septal or posterior septal more than we do anterior posterior. Yeah. But at least based on how that has worked for us, you know, you may give the 90 degree clockwise a shot. It's nice to use M to bend it down. It just feels familiar and comfortable, which is always nice, but I think it also gives you the, the leeway of then using um, kind of plus minus. I, I don't even, I don't, you know, I don't recall the last time that I, I used the, the A or P knobs in that setting, but plus minus really helps you to kind of bend your entire system one way or other. And in that regard might help you get towards AP easier. Hmm. All right. We'll think we'll we'll have to discuss. Um, it's a thought. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I already got a text message from one of our our group being like, "Okay, we'll try that on the demo." This is another <laughs> thing I gotta learn. We, you really should get on my level. You should come to come to what we're doing, so I don't have to go figure something else new. <laughs> Listen, I, if you can get me a ticket out to Seattle, I will be there in a heartbeat. Okay, I'm going to get you an Amtrak ticket, and then we'll see. <laughs> 50 year anniversary. 
So uh, as, as Burkhard said, right? I mean, it, being patient with, uh, with the imaging and really understanding it um, with the entire group, uh, I think is important, right? I mean, there's a question here, is the posterior arm really in there? I don't know, maybe it is. On some views, I think it is. And some views, I don't think it is. And, you know, to just to say parenthetically, I know you guys have the, the luxury there of, of having a dedicated imager that understands what's happening with the procedure, what's happening in the, you know, from an imaging side and a kind of a botanology side of the mitra clip. You know, we have, we thankfully in, in recent years have had that same luxury with a couple of our imagers, um, Rhonda Miyasaka and Serge Harb. And, and the fact that they, you know, have a commitment to being in the operating room and understanding these procedures, you know, is as much of an advance to being able to treat these patients successfully as anything that sort of the device itself has improved, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's huge. Um, so, so hold, in this- Hold on one second, what do you guys, what do you do about money? Let's just go there. Let's have this conversation. Because uh, <laughs> they don't get paid very well for that. Yeah, you know, they are, so the way that it works um, for our folks, right? It, um, we're, a, we're a salaried institution. Um, and so kind of pro productivity is not something that outside of sort of broad strokes and, and large sort of spectrum of productivity, anything is appreciated as long as you have a clear sort of value add in some way. So they're, look, on their echo reading days, they're still reading between 60 and 70 echoes in a day. They're still seeing a lot of outpatients on their outpatient days, but on, on, their, on their OR day, on, you know, for Rhonda on Wednesday, she is committed to being in the OR for as long as I am. And she does, you know, I do two mitra clips on Wednesday and she does two mitra clips Wednesday. That's just how it is. But that's a luxury that I know is not is possible in our kind of salary and practice model. It's not unfortunately possible for many people, but I think that that's part of, you know, there are a ton of people out there doing mitro clips and tricuspid clips. And I think if the, in if the institution, hospital, whatever, can't figure out how to make that work, they're just not going to have as good results as people that can commit an imager to being in the operating room to do this. And I think that, you know, as good as we can get with the devices we make and the images we make, unless the people are, are spending the time to do it, they can't be good. You know, if you look at the TVT registry, there's such a massive heterogeneity in the quality of mitral clipping that happens. And I think the part of that's operator skill, but I think part of that's imaging skill. Yeah. Burkhard, do you have thoughts about any of that? Yes, I do. Um... I, I'm fully uh, with Amar on that, that the institutional, the, uh, the, the practice, the hospital, uh, and, and, and therefore the heart valve team, the structural team needs to come around the realization that, that you can be a, a master interventional cardiologist or, or you know, some cardiac surgeons that pursue this as well, but you need to have a, a, a consistent team uh, that includes an imager that is available, experienced, and, and has prior work experience with you in order to be really successful. And so for that to happen, um, I, I do believe that we should not just um, feel like co-proceduralists, but actually thought of that as such. And the hospital needs to acknowledge that. Um, otherwise, as, as Amar says, uh, the interest will not be there. The justification will not be as easy, and 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 you won't have consistency. I know that some premier institutions, even five years ago, would have alternating imagers on a given day, and and the interventional cardiologist would not even know who shows up that given day, and that's just not uh, going to be successful. Especially as we add new devices, uh, we add new technologies on a on a regular basis now that have new features. And, and the imaging platform, frankly, changes all the time. So you have to be, you have to be really um, exposed to it to, to improve as a team. Yeah. All right, man, I want to see how this turns out. Let's do this. <laughs> so you can appreciate, again, the, the septal leaflet, I think, looks really nice falling in the, in the arm there. Tough to tell in the posterior leaflet. Uh, and perhaps, as you might imagine, um, there's a lack of posterior leaflet capture here, much more visible once you actually close this clip. 
And you can appreciate then that it's, uh, you know, the, the tricuspid lead, or sorry, the pacemaker lead is just sitting right there. And so, <clears throat> again, uh, one of the benefits here of, of orienting the 3D plane uh, in kind of the proper anatomic configuration, you can see this is where we started. So if we just clockwise the clip a little bit, so if you pay attention to that 3D box, you can see it's just slightly clockwise or just a, a little bit in this sort of the meteor portion, if you will, of the posterior leaflet. And you see it really nicely falling uh, into, the, into the posterior arm there on the top left box. And then once we, uh, this is just kind of showing the fluoroscopic orientation, really understanding again how the, uh, while this is certainly a primarily echocardiographically uh, directed procedure, I think it's really helpful um, for, the, for the biplane fluoro in this case, especially because we knew that the pacemaker lead was one of our landmarks uh, to understand how we go just in front of it and just behind it. Uh, and so here then is the, is the poster leaflet, I think grasped a little bit more securely here. Uh, and then kind of when all is said and done, from that sort of torrential uh, TR that we had, uh, we've got um, we've got this kind of final result. I, I have to be honest; I was a bit tempted to crop out the the right box and just show the left, but I thought that would be too unbelievable, and you'd say there's no way that's the final result. So I wanted to be clear: you can see the pacemaker lead on the right box, and there's you know certainly a mild TR left, but um, you know I, I think just. Under these pacemaker cases, I think are a really important thing to highlight because if you look at, you know, the number of patients that have a pacemaker lead and have TR, um, you know, up to a third of patients with, with leads have TR. And I think that there aren't any good solutions, you know, we're pulling out the lead. I don't frankly find to be very helpful. Certainly we have not in our institution. And I think there's as much of a chance that the next lead goes in another bad place or pulling out the lead if it's been in there for a long time, you know, hurts, hurts the leaflets with the laser extractors and so forth. So, you know, I think understanding how to navigate around them uh, and really, frankly, that 3D MPR is, is the way to do that is I think really important. Yeah. I was just gonna, I was just gonna um, briefly highlight because the, that, you know, that kind of a case, even though we did it, you know, two months ago or three months ago is now become sort of past news because now with the, with a G4 system and, and both commercially and in Triluminate um, with independent grasping, I think is a huge advance, especially in the tricuspid side. So this is of course a different patient, but you can appreciate here again, that the pacemaker lead is really hurting us in terms of uh, uh, kind of orienting towards the posterior leaflet and pulling that away. And so with the independent grasping, we can just kind of swing around the pacemaker lead, get that posterior leaflet into the arm, as you see there. Once that gripper is down, we can then swing back over, kind of just a little bit of clockwise on the front guide, really scoop out underneath that septal leaflet. Um, and then we've got a nice uh, nice kind of a grasp there. And, and again, a, a nice result right, right next to that pacemaker lead. And so again, I, I, I don't want to I frankly don't want to overestimate the benefits of the device iterations because I think the imaging uh, is is certainly imperative to to this kind of a thing. Um, I think before we, I'm certainly happy to just you know have just a couple of slides on the data that's out there, but certainly happy to stop here and and we can talk through some more case based stuff. Yeah, no, I I mean I. Um... The, our audience wants to hear from Dr. Harari. They're fired up about that, but I think that um, I think it's important to show to just. I mean, it's it's nighttime. We don't want to go too heavy on the data, but let's let's do a little data just just quickly um, to to kind of solidify the point and um, and then. Um, Sure. So, um, you know, this is this was a nice kind of a TVT analysis that um, that Paul Saraja had done a couple of years ago, uh, and so by virtue of being TVT, it was primarily a degenerative MR group. But you can see that in these patients, you know, treated for their mitral regurgitation, that tricuspid regurgitation was an independent predictor of of their mortality out at <clears throat> 12 months, and those folks with severe TR did worse. And certainly that's paralleled by the data that's come out from COAPT. 
Uh, again, whether you were treated with you know, guideline-directed medical therapy or you were treated with mitraclip, uh, if you had significant TR, you did worse than, than if you didn't have significant TR, uh, whether or not the, the mitral regurgitation was treated optimally. And so I think in that regard, uh, you know, understanding how kind of percutaneous repairs will, will help. This is, you know, a European uh, registry data, of course, looking at um, uh, TRAMI and, and trivalve. So understanding both sort of mitral treatment only versus mitral and tricuspid. Those who had both valves treated seemed to do better again out at one year. Uh, similarly, in a group of patients with isolated uh, TR, um, those patients who had a successful uh, repair seemed to fare better than those who did not. Now, you could, you could make all of the negative arguments about this. This is registry data. There's obviously significant differences in the patients uh, and why they were treated, why they had a successful uh, procedure versus a failed procedure and what have you. But I think, you know, outside of having great randomized data, I think seeing how the signals uh, how the signals kind of move in the same directions is sort of how we practice medicine in the absence of randomized trial data. And so if you look at, you know, potentially what might be the most sort of well-designed uh, data, at least as far as having good follow-up and core labs and so forth, is at least the European Triluminate data that was recently uh, published. And if you look at, you know, what I think is, is pretty striking here uh, again, with the knowledge that tricuspid clipping is still a relatively, you know, early and, and sort of nuanced procedure, at, at baseline, you have almost 90% of patients have severe or more TR. And after uh, treatment, whether it's at 30 days or out at one year, because the result was pretty durable, uh, you know, you have uh, essentially only about 20 to 30% of patients have severe or more TR. So, the result was good of tricuspid clipping and it was durable. Uh, essentially same results between 30 days and one year. So worries about leaflet detachment and further annular dilation and so forth, you know, were, uh, were sort of, I think in my opinion, sort of waylaid by that. And then functionally patients also did really well. You had patients with, you know, the majority of whom were in class three or class four heart failure symptoms kind of down to about 80% in NYHA class one or two. And frankly, if you look at any of the MitraClip data that's out there, whether it's TVT or Everest two or whatever people want to quote, that's basically what you're looking at. You're looking at 80% of people or so with NYHA class one or two symptoms. Yeah. I think, you know, to, to a point that, that, that we made earlier, and, and I know this is a bit of a controversial point, but, you know, at least in that 85 patients of Triluminate, those patients who had, you know, continued sort of severe or greater TR didn't do as well as those patients who had a better procedural result. And remember, these were patients who were approved for the study based on conference calls and so on and so forth. And so the expectation was that these patients would do at least reasonably well. And so I think that, you know, no one wants to hear that that they shouldn't be doing a certain procedure. But I think it's really important as we talk about procedures, especially newer procedures, that we remember that, you know, it's probably better that there are a few people that do a ton of them than a ton of people that do a few of them. Yeah. Um, that, those are very helpful data. N nowhere in that um, did you talk about symptoms. So, I, um, while I want um, maybe Raf to jump in here and get some slides, get a, a case going to show, and I know Burkhardt has one too, but while he's doing that, talk symptoms for a minute. What, what is your feeling on that? If you've got torrential TR, is it, does it matter if you have symptoms? What are they? Half the people don't even know what things you're supposed to, you know, like what are you even supposed to ask about? Obviously when they have when they're getting paracentesis and have cardiac cirrhosis, you know they have symptoms, but that's also when they're probably not gonna get a ton of benefit. So what, what's, what's your take there when you're seeing these folks in clinic? Sorry, me or Raph? You. Uh, um, you you're know, like, I wanted to avoid that one. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. So I am, I will be honest, I, um, for as, for as many cases as I do and, and, and love to do them, I am extraordinarily risk averse. Uh, 
And, and the point of saying that is I, I think a lot about the potential risks of procedures. And I have that conversation pretty directly with patients. And so unless it's very clear to me that they are symptomatic and that I'm gonna improve their quality of life, I just don't feel like it's worth it for them or for me to do a procedure. And so in that regard, um, and I, you know, I'm certain most of us are you know, similarly feeling about procedural risks versus benefits. And so you know, to me, I spend a lot of time really trying to ascertain what the symptoms are. And you, you know, you've already pointed out the very obvious ones, but I think over time, what I've realized more and more is that the symptoms that are more subtle, things like exertional fatigue, you know, things that we don't necessarily attribute to, to significant TR are very real symptoms. And I say that by virtue of, you know, if someone doesn't have lower extremity swelling or abdominal ascites, and yet they say, look, I'm pretty fatigued, even the setting of normal PA pressures, I find that to be still attributable to the TR. Sure. And I think as long as the patient understands that, you know, that, you know, that there's these symptoms may probably, but not always be related to those symptoms, and it's worth a shot, I, I'm okay to go with it. You know, it, it's tough when you've got the patient who says they're fatigued and they also have some COPD and maybe their PA pressure is, you know, 64 and, you know, they're also 87 years old. It's tougher. And I think that's just a bit of a goals of care, you know, conversation to me. But what are your thoughts? How do you approach that? I, I, don't, I was waiting for you to just give me the key. Um, <laughs> I we i agree it's uh i will agree with you that um that a kind of wind out of my sails or just a generalized fatigue syndrome is seems to be more common than um than abdominal bloating or just lower extremity edema i think these folks have poor cardiac output and poor forward flow just by virtue of a lot of, you know, the, mm -hmm. they're not getting the preload to the left ventricle um, and exertional um, fatigue and exertion, even exertional, some like breathlessness kind of features do seem to be present. Now, I also agree that most of the people that get sent for this right now are muddy. I mean, they're not, you know, they're not, uh, they didn't just get done with their mergers and acquisition uh, board meeting to come and, I mean, maybe at the Cleveland Clinic, that's how it rolls, but not here. <laughs> so, um, so it's, it's confusing um, yeah. for sure. I don't know. Raph, let. Yeah. So, so the, the one thing I'll add to that, Jamie, is the, the interesting observation that I think we've all made over the past several years treating these patients uh, with uh, severe TR is the discrepancy between a less than perfect result and patients who you see in clinic and feel like a million bucks. Mm -hmm. And we've had many of these patients who go home and you're not thrilled with the results that you got, you have moderate TR left behind and you see them in clinic and they feel like a totally different person. I think that goes back a little bit to what we're talking uh, about at the beginning of the talk in terms of grading the severity of TR going into the case and the, the um, the gray that exists in, in the, the scale of uh, severity by echo parameters and uh, so on. Um, in an effort not to put people to sleep on the East Coast, I'm gonna skip a little bit the um, data slides that I had. I'll just mention quickly, since we're talking about uh, transcatheter uh, edge to edge repair, that there's, there's a, a few important differences in the approach to the tricuspid uh, valve and the mitral valve and the anatomy of these valves that makes the mitral clip for the tricuspid valve a, a much more challenging procedure. And as we saw from the data, less often successful. So the tricuspid valve, as we know, is, is a large, uh, larger annulus. The gaps that we see uh, in co-optation tend to be bigger. There's three leaflets to deal with. Oftentimes we're dealing with a lead that's either in the way or causing pathology that we have to address. So the, the procedure itself is, is a lot more involved, a lot more challenging with the technology that we have available. Um, I'll skip a little bit of the data. These are the two largest registries that we have, and I'll focus on the data from um, the Trival Registry, which is a, a registry, a multi-center registry involving uh, close to 300 patients um, looking at outcomes for patients with uh, 
class three or four New York uh, Heart Association symptoms and severe tricuspid regurg. Um, and this is replicating a bit of the, the results that Amar showed a little bit earlier with some of the other studies in terms of the reduction uh, in, tri in tricuspid regurgitation and the improvement in symptoms. Something to note here is that procedural success, and this is defined as uh, moderate or less TR, the conclusion of the procedure was associated with improved survival at 12 months, uh, which is something that I found pretty interesting. Um, and in terms of the success rate, they had a 78% success rate. The procedural success rate, which meant putting one clip on the valve was 96%. And as we know, that doesn't always translate to a good result. Um, the other important uh, thing to mention about this study is there's a few things that they identified that were associated with uh, unfavorable uh, results from the from the procedure and that's that had to do a little bit with the echo parameters that we discussed a little bit earlier in terms of the uh, vena contracta area the jet location and the jet direction um, and the presence or not of uh, pacemaker leads so with that in mind i think we should go ahead and discuss a second case i think that's what people are here for and we, Amar and I did not reconvene before the talk and we didn't agree to talk about pacemaker leads, but this is something that comes up a lot in clinical practice. So, so you'll see a little bit of that um, tonight. So this is a 70 year old, uh, 75 year old gentleman. He has a history of uh, volume overload that's really been refractory to medical therapy, class three symptoms. He really had functional, atrial functional TR for a long time and was supposed to get treated. And then around the holidays, things got delayed and he had an episode of ET and then got an ASCD. So you, you'll see there's a lead in the way, but really this is uh, TR that preceded the, the lead placement. Uh, by T, he had an ERO 0.8 and the RV severely dilated 6.6. .6. Um, I'll just hit play on these so you can get a, a sense of the what we're dealing with. And you can see the uh, annulus is dilated, the right atrium is massively dilated. There's uh, severe or torrential or massive PR, uh, at least severe, as you can see. And really, this is one of the views that we use quite often when there's a lead in the way. This is a transgastric, and you can appreciate the lead there, tethering the uh, septal leaflet. And this, when we're dealing with patients with leads, this is one of the views that we use in terms of planning the procedure and where we're going to try to clip. And oftentimes, what we do is start at the anterior septal commissure and start billing from there. And, you know, oftentimes we, we have the first clip not really make too much of an impact in TR, but really set up the stage for the second and third clips. And that was the approach that we took here. The, the, the approach was going to be to start at the anterior septal commissure and, and bill from there. Um, as you see, there's a lot of TR through the anterior septal commissure and the septal posterior commissures. Keep going. Yeah, it's a little, okay. Um, again, baseline parameters that were consistent with uh, severe TR, the 3D vena contract error 4.5. Um, and we'll see the final result in a little bit. So this is the first clip. The lead is, uh, again, tethering the pacemaker, uh, the septal leaflet, and you have the first clip across the anteroseptal commissure there. And again, a little bit improvement in TR, but not really much of a difference from the uh, initial T, and this is what you see on 3D color. So the goal from there was to build on that first clip and get a second clip across the septal anterior commissure, uh, and we were successful in doing so. I'll go on to the next slide. This is the uh, first clip, and you again see not much of an impact on the TR. And this is the, the setup for the second clip. Uh, again, we're looking at that multiplane view that Amar was alluding to a little bit earlier. Um, I'm also having a bit of difficulty playing it, but the goal here was to, again, clip a, along the interceptal commissure and keep the lead um, away from those two clips. So that's the first clip, that's the second clip there, and that's the lead. And as you can see, there's a fair amount of reduction in TR, but there's still residual TR, mostly through the anterior and posterior leaflets. And that's when we turned our attention and decided to go a little bit um, different than when we normally do. And we, again, uh, try to go anterior posterior, with, which is a little bit more challenging to get to. But Tell we felt. One second, Ralph. I just need we there's um, 
like I don't know if you guys felt it or not. Um, uh, it uh, thing the, that like little weird tingle. Um, uh, but uh, we got a, we got another panelist uh, to join our ranks. I called I called for backup. Uh, I, I put a big uh, light and cut out a, a little bat and uh, shined it up into the, and this guy from Gotham City showed up. So, Mark Reisman, thanks for uh, thanks for being on. Um, it uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, another uh, awesome tricuspid expert. So um, feel free to chime in um, as Raf's uh, showing this case. Sorry, Raf. Keep going. No, thank you. Welcome, Mark. Good to see you. Um, this you. is, as I mentioned, this is the uh, third clip that we place along the anterior posterior commissure, and this is the the end result. Again, not not perfect, but a significant change from baseline. And as you'll see, some of the parameters. Um, and, and this is, I, I don't know what these mean. I don't know if we're looking for a uh, relative change in vena contracta area. Are we looking for a specific number in, in the end result here? Um, by hemodynamics, the hepatic veins normalized. This is the TT a month later, which is mild to moderate, but most importantly, the, the patient felt night and day compared to what they were feeling before the the procedure. So I think that's that's a win all around. And I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of what these numbers, what we should be aiming to get in terms of some of the parameters that we discussed a little bit earlier. So with that, I'll open it to the panel or questions that the, the group may have about this uh, particular procedure. Yeah, Burkhardt, talk, talk a little bit about, um, about you know, you're, you're, we're watching these clips go in and then you have this moment where you have to decide you're you're maybe two clips in anteroceptal and that's that's perhaps common and then you have to decide where you're going to go next um how, how do you make those decisions what's the thought process and then um let's start there and then there's a question to the group um do you aim for caging the pacemaker lead in the commissure or keep it in the center so let's uh let's discuss those two for a sec before we move to the next one um, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, if we do have time, I have a case where we actually did um, kind of respond to this question that's in the chat right now in terms of pinning a lead that is profoundly mobile to begin with. And I believe that's actually a case that, that Mark um, himself uh, participated, so it'd be quite uh, timely. Anyway, uh, to answer your first question, I do believe it uh, depends on a number of items, which is where's the remnant TR? where in the valve. Then secondly, can we produce a convincing situation to see that we have two leaflets that can be brought together? Meaning, do we have an image plane and do we have a leaflet plane where we have long enough leaflets that can be brought together to create a new co-optation where there's none at this point? And then how close are we to any obstacles, be it uh, this pacemaker lead, uh, if it's still very mobile, it's not uh, without risk to get uh, entangled and uh, kind of work around it. And then, and then lastly, um, how about the other clips? And what I will say is, uh, in this large number of patients that we've treated, uh, there has been there has been a number of cases uh, where. Uh, trying to aim for an even better result coming close to a clip that may be um, not as well uh, placed as in an ideal mitral case. It's maybe a little easier to do. There has been a, a, a rare but, but still an incidence of dislodging a part of a clip and then having a single leaflet detachment. So I think that, that that's an important one to kind of caution about, and I'd be interested to get the opinion from, uh, from Mark in, in that regard. Specifically around the, the, the lead uh, manipulation or? The lead and then the risk to dislodge a freshly placed uh, clip on the tricuspid valve where admittedly at times our visibility is not as good. And I think we, we certainly have a bit of a higher risk to get a single leaflet detachment as opposed to the mitral valve. Yeah, so in terms of detachment, I think the experience has been if, if the first clip is, is in the commissure, it, it's pretty safe um, because you're generally getting good leaflet insertion. 
Um, I think the few that we've had have been um, when we're out of the commissure and more towards the middle of the valve, and then at a second clip, actually just, you know, sometimes crossing the, the valve, we've, I've had a, or we've had a single leaflet detachment. Um, so that's not uncommon. Um, in terms of management of the lead, what you guys did here is, you know, just, just ideal, you know, you just sort of, uh, in, you know, basically uh, trapped it or, or managed it uh, optimally in terms of reducing the leak in the interceptal uh, area. And then you have that pop-off valve experience or, you know, just the, the leak seems to either find its way through the, the, the path of least resistance or um, that was obviously there previously, but maybe more intense now and just sort of chasing it a little bit. Um, and as you know, the dealing with the anterior posterior leaflets um, is a little bit more, um, not challenging in terms of grasp, but in terms of um, getting a good result. So um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's really a lot of learning here uh, as we continue to proceed. Um, Raf, do you, I know we've got, uh, we've got a half hour. So you wanna just show another case quickly and then we'll get to Burkhardt's case to, to wrap it up? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the second one may be the one that Burkhardt is alluding to. So I'll skip that one. I'll go to the um, third case that I have, which is really a bonus case. Um, and another, in this particular case, we had a patient who uh, 77 with a lot of risk factors, and a lot of symptoms. The good thing about this patient is she had a pacemaker that was no longer functioning. So the lead was in the way, but as you'll see, um, we had to get creative and, and find a, a good use for it. So um, severe symptoms of, of TR, really class four symptoms, um, severe tricuspid regurgitation, transgastric, you see the lead again, really like in the central aspect of the orifice, but really tethering the septal leaflet, a, a massive coaptation gap here. Um, and we had a similar approach to the prior patient, which was starting at the anteroceptal commissure and building from there. And we basically did that successfully uh, until we got to a point where we ran out of, of room in the um, anteroceptal leaflet. We still had um, a CC, severe TR left behind. And despite multiple attempts, we just couldn't breach that gap that we had between the anter and the septal leaflet. And in part, that was because that leaflet, that uh, lead was tethering uh, the septal leaflet, not really allowing us to, to get that clip in there and grasp uh, those two leaflets. So uh, Jamie got, um, you can see it here, the lead tethering the septal leaflet and not really allowing for a third clip to go there and, and bridge that gap. Um, so Jamie got really creative here and we did a, a few extra steps to essentially snare that lead out of the way to allow that third clip to be placed uh, next adjacent to that second clip across the interest at the leaflet. This was a second axis through a femoral vein. We got a direct catheter and essentially snared and externalized a glide advantage wire that was uh, looped across the, the lead so as to essentially pull the, retract the lead uh, and allow for the clip to go into that position. You see the clip, the third clip loaded and ready to go as we have the catheter with the externalized wire looping around the lead and, and tethering that lead out of the way. Um, and you have the floor here of that lead getting, you know, tethered out of the way and the clip being delivered at the position that we were aiming to deliver it to. Um, well, it's good that this was a bonus case, because if this was your first case, this was a mic drop. The conference would have ended right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is um, probably one of the highlights of the year, I must say. Um, and as you can see, and this is one of the challenges with, with patients with lead to multiple clips, the imaging gets really murky at times, and it's really hard to say what's what. But you have to believe me here, we have three clips there. Um, and this is the, the end result, which again, it's admittedly less than perfect, but the patient felt significantly better. And frankly, with what we had, I think it's um, the best we could have done. Um, so and, if, you don't, if you don't mind, I, I'd love your guys' impression here. And you know, whether on this case or, or others, right? It's really hard. It's really hard for me to see anything here, right? Based on the, the shadowing of everything and so on. And so when do, when do you think about 
and Burkhard, this is not an offense to you, I promise. But Jamie, when do you think about bringing the ice catheter in and saying, look, I want to I wanna look at this from the right atrium and do I get a better understanding? You know, I... Um, so we actually got the ice catheter in for this case. And it... Yeah. I'm, I'm ready to... Uh, I've got Burkhardt's glove size in the back and the gown. We're, we're re he's ready to scrub in. Um, <laughs> I, I think we haven't really um, tried much, and I want Mark to comment on this because I think he has. I'll be honest that I'm... Um, I'm no expert ice expert and I can I use it for the things that people use it for but um but I don't I I don't know I think one aspect of ice for me thus far is that it's fairly passive I mean you sort of like you know you find your PFO and then you put a wet towel over the thing and you just tell it to like stay there right and then you go and do what you're doing uh, whereas there's nothing about the imaging of these cases that is that's passive right it's always a dynamic imaging situation and i think to i've been a, i've been kind of daydreaming about how this would look and i think that to make it work successfully you'd really have to have two active operators one with the ice and one with the with the device, because I don't think one person can do both simultaneously. I know I, or I believe I can't, though I haven't really tried it. Uh, Mark, you you gave it a go uh, a couple times, if I recall. What what's your impression? Yeah, so I um, my impression was that it was very difficult. Um, you know, I think having previous clips in gives you sort of a fiduciary point, like a you know a landmark where you're rotating around. Um, so that's helpful. Um, if you're looking for something just like insertion or uh, co-op, you know, you're in the right location. Um, but the more recent cases I've seen, and then we just had this TVARC meeting where there was some discussion about this, um, the Philips and, and Siemens, and um, there's a couple of smaller companies that have 3D systems that look really quite good. So what you ultimately do is you create the 3D image and then you go backwards from that and create the X planes off the 3D. Um, and you are not doing a lot of manipulation, uh, which was surprising. Uh, so I think um, I, I think in, engaging um, the imager, um, the TEE -E person, I think is, is um, I think that's the way to go. I do think it's two people. And then you always have the option for that person, you know, someone like Burkhart, to you know, do TEE if that's required, or even trans thoracic. Um, but I think we're going to be in the next couple of years more impressed with the opportunity to use um, to use eyes. Are we? I mean, unfortunately, we got this. You know, this three D ice system. The catheters are so expensive. Right. The, the, the conversation was like, well, don't you know, don't use those <laughs> if you don't have to because yeah. they're really costly. And then you never use them and therefore you have no idea how to use them and no one knows how to run the machine and so forth and so on and it's completely self-perpetuating um and now i have to get the swiffer out anytime i want to consider it because you gotta you know they get to get, get the guy cleaned off before you bring it in the room so yeah no no it's 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 yeah it's really um challenging because of the cost and uh i think that's just a uh, you know competition in the field, um, you know, all the things that usually drive costs down. Um, but if I just look at what's happening on the MitraClip side, I, I just um, moderated a live case by uh, Jason and Ginan in, um, in, at Davis. Uh, and that was uh, on the Mitra side. That, that turned out quite nice using the Siemens system. And then the number of uh, folks are using the 3D ice for, and even 2D ice for, uh, for LAAO. I think at present, it, it, you're giving up a lot. If, if you could do a TE, you're giving up quite a bit. Um, but in some cases where that's not possible for a variety of reasons, then obviously to consider it. Um, but you, I mean, you're right on top of the tricuspid valve. I've got to believe that this has got to be a, a low hanging fruit for these systems, right? I don't know. Have you, Amr? You have any experience trying it? I, mean, I, I you know, the uh, similar to to what you guys are saying. You know, if if I'm doing it on my own, the only reason I'm using ice is to just 
hopefully confirm that I've got leaflet grasp and, and I couldn't see it as well on the TEE. You know, if it's a situation where the TEE is so limited that we've got to have one person manipulating the ice and one person manipulating the, the system, as you said, you know, that's when Dr. Kapati and I are doing a case together and one person's doing one and one person's doing the other. We've had, you know, similar to you, we had, you know, we had five Siemens 3D ice catheters that we got to, you know, to trial because uh, they're really, really expensive, as you said. But the beautiful thing of that is that once you get a, an approximate view, as Mark said, you just leave that in place and your imaging colleague who's used to using 3D MPR on the TEE is using the same machine on the ice or the same kind of buttonology and, you know, creates beautiful images with the, you know, the imaging planes cut out nicely. And so, you know, if it, if it's, if it were affordable, it would be a great, great process. Yeah. yeah, I think it's only a question of time when that technology gets to the next level and we will have uh, even better opportunity with multi-planar assessment based on ice uh, that then can be complementary to TE. Birka, do you want to mention some of the new Philips uh, software and its applicability or um, its use on the tricuspid side? Uh, they have this glass imaging, which I, I, I've used it twice on the mitral side. I thought it was really helpful to see where the, you know, the, uh, the piece of starts on the ventricular side. Is it, is it going to have the same impact on the tricuspid side, do you think? I suspect it will. And, you know, Armour in his cases, as well as in some of the cases that uh, Raphael showed here, uh, is certainly using the multiplanar instant and real time display at all times and almost not needing to go in and out of that modality anymore, depending on resolution, it is a huge plus. And, and then some of those opportunities to, to have what's, what's described as a glass view where you can look a little bit more through the tissue and maybe you see the clip better in its true orientation, which again, uh, we should uh, over, not, when we cannot really overemphasize how important it is to have perpendicularity with the leaflets and make sure you're not getting a side bite, you're not pinwheeling the leaflet. Um, and so over and over again, go back to that 3D orientation and make sure we get that, um, get both leaflets in the fold um, in a, in a perpendicular fashion with the free leaflet edge really fall, falling into the, into the V of the clip. So yes, uh, anything that can help. And again, also, I think that the, the fact that now the imaging platform companies are working much more closely with the structure heart companies that device companies in terms of, you know, how does the material actually become more visible and what tracking mechanism can we think of that could be developed for the future so that we have certainty and we're not guessing even in what uh, a moment ago was described as a murky image, maybe we can still see the clip orientation and at least have certainty about that. Um, that would already be a step in the right direction. And then lastly, I would say the, the opportunity to have fusion imaging and, and look at fluoroscopy and echo, or maybe a CT that's uploaded up front uh, to inform us ahead of time is, is also a, quite an opportunity that, that's um, early stage right now, but, but continues to be developed. Yeah, the, the only other comment I'll make is when I, when I first um, started doing that, I think one of the first or second case I did, I was in Zurich with my Zano and um, I was struck by how much um, fluoro he used for clip orientation. It was quite remarkable. I don't know, Jamie or anyone like a comment about, you know, looking at fluoro and different views for, for clip orientation? Now that now that you're gone and Steve Sorensen only has me to, <laughs> to suffer through, he's been on me about just going REO20 um, for all the tricuspids and kind of working in that orientation. Uh, I've been doing it recently because uh, why not? I mean, it, I feel like every case I learn something new about how I wish I had been doing it all along. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we've been doing that. I will say that I'm getting a little more comfortable 
just like steering down to the valve under fluoro without um, without sort of seeing the clip in the the right atrium the whole time by echo um, and I think some of the alignment of the the clip arms by fluoro is helpful though um, as you kind of move through the valve and um, and so forth it is um, or you switch orientation boy it can get a little confusing um, what the the orientation should be if you go from anterior septal to anterior posterior or something like that um, on fluoro I mean on echo it's you know the the gastric views I think are the best way to line that up yeah just um let me if, if uh, I guess we have a few minutes right um if you'd let me share my screen that'd be great for a second yeah and I'm gonna someone raise their hand. I'm just gonna let uh, let them ask a question while you're getting your stuff. How do I go back to that? While you're getting your your stuff up here. So keep keep going. Uh, Luciana, you your your mic is on. Yeah, Ralphie, I think you have to stop sharing it to let me go. He should have he should have stopped. Um, John Michael, you might need. Hey, we got it. We got it. We got it. Thanks. Luciana, you had your hand raised. I think you're muted. Well, I tried. But, uh... I was, um... you know, Jamie, one thing I would say is I think fluoroscopically, you know, once you're moving the you know, the mitral clip in and out or tricuspid clip in and out, it's, you're not really looking that much at the, at the, at the fluoro, right? You're looking more at the echo. And so I think having the, the fluoro and the LAO projection, at least for me, really helps to orient between, you know, which of those leaflets we're going for and especially to make sure it hasn't turned. I know we're looking at that on the glass view and the 3D and everything else, but especially if you're dealing with kind of pacemaker leads and the kind of what you're aiming for there, I find the LAO pretty helpful. Yeah, so I, 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 you're able to see my screen? Uh, Elio, what? Yes, we can. You, you know, usually I just end up going sort of a straight LAO, give or take about 30 to 30 to 40, somewhere in that range. Okay. I'll try it. Yeah, I just, I was looking, I, I find, you know, just, I was a reminder, you know, I just gave a, a talk like this, but just looking at these views, which are very basic, but you get a sense you, know, you could use the um, the aortic root as somewhat of a landmark to know where you're going, sometimes in or out. Um, and this is just a you know just an AP view here. And then you have the LAO 45 here, which again could be somewhat helpful to identify where the septal leaflet or the anterior leaflet might be uh, on the valve. I just found this to be um, a little bit helpful um, as I as I manipulate. And then the relationship, obviously, this is more of a lateral view, which we would generally never use, right? Just to try to get orientation as well. But you could imagine if you're sort of in a, really a lot of trouble, right? You're sort of lost. <laughs> Sometimes we are, at least I am. Mm -hmm. uh, this could be somewhat helpful. Yeah, I mean, that basically just kind of mimics a, a gastric uh, TE view, right? Yes, but, but, but to the point of uh, having fusion imaging, uh, Mark, if you, in vision, you don't have to overlap that, that 3D, uh, but you actually have synergy and you, you have an option to fade in and fade out with the echo on the fluoroscopy. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that really will be the future uh, in, my, in my mind. And so Absolutely. we'll give a lot of comfort and, and certainty. Absolutely. So these are the, just the fluoro images. Yeah. So, what fluoro image are you? What do you think is? Do you have a preference, or do you think you got to just kind of understand them all? Um, I would just, you know, my first fluoro view is is really is to get down to the valve is generally the RAO, um, and um, just gives me an orientation down to the valve. And then, in terms of dealing with the septum, I'm usually in the AP or a little bit um, LAO, um, just to know that I'm off the septum. Sometimes. Depending, I mean, I got a nice picture here. Depending um, how you're coming in, right, from the IVC um, and your relationship to the valve, um, it's really very quite variable. 
um, this relationship specifically coming up and in. And I think, I don't know, Amar, are you guys doing Tri-Send yet? Or Jamie, are you guys doing Tri-Send yet? The evoke valve? We, we haven't done any, but I've been on a bunch of those calls. Um, and it's remarkable that this, this turn here is, is, can be just like, um, you know, just a, con a conventional directs or, you know, just a, a Gillis bend and you're on top of the valve or just a bend uh, using uh, a knob. Um, but if you look at some of the 3D work that is being done for Evoke, there, this, this could, there could be a second sort of, or a second um, sort of vector that's coming off here in, in, in order to get into the center of the valve. Um, so that's, a, that's what, um, you know, I think it's important to understand and when, you're, when you're using those views, especially trying to get off the septum. I don't know if you've been in a situation where you, you come in and you're just literally leaning on the septum of the, uh, of the intraatrial septum. Sure, yeah. Um... yeah. Here's a nice view also, of just that, that, that orientation, right, coming up. So usually you come up, you're like digging into the wall here. Yes, yeah. Well, that's cool. Mm. Um, Burkhart, we got just, a, I wanna be respectful of uh, East Coast time. Do you wanna show one last case? I know you were, you had something prepared, so I want. Could certainly do that, but uh, if we are already uh, too close to finishing, then we can just um, wrap up, uh, you tell me. I have it ready. Um, well, I think we've seen a bunch of good cases, and I, I guess um, maybe we let we'll we'll close down. But um, I, I want to just get everyone's like, what's what's the thing you're working on when it? Because we all have things we need to work on with tricuspid. So maybe we wrap up with what's the thing that in the next six months you want to work on or get better at when it comes to tricuspids? Because I I, I bet there's a lot of things we could all stand to get better at. And so maybe Raf, let's start with you. Um, what, what, what do we need to do better in the next six months that's on your, on your list you're thinking about? Yeah, that's a tough question. I think something that's been disappointing is the couple patients that have a really good outcome leave the hospital, do well for a period of time and come back either with recurrent TR and the clip still in place. And I, I don't think I have a good answer as to why that happens or what patients would have that happen more likely to them as opposed to not happen. And then the patients that come back with um, a leaflet attachment. And we've had um, not many, but a couple of those that had a really good result, left the hospital, and a few days later, a week later, had symptoms again, and come back for an echo and have a, a, a clip that fell off on one of the leaflets. Uh, I don't have good answers, but I think trying to identify patients where that's more likely to happen um, would be a, a, a goal for the next few months, yeah. I don't know if you mentioned it, Jamie, but I think the, the recognized incidence right now of SLD is about six to seven percent. On the yeah. side. I don't know if you guys higher that. than on the mitral side. Yeah. yeah um, has anybody moved away from XTW? Have any of you guys moved away from XTW in these tricuspid cases? I, I heard, you know, there's been some discussion about whether or not NTW, you know, is will just hold a little better. You know, you start with an XTW to bring things together and then go uh, a little shorter. Anybody? No, oh, I mean we 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 default to the XTW, frankly, all the time for everything. You know, the only, you know, I, I know that there's this sort of academic discussion about well, does it tug things too much? But frankly, I find that it's hard to grasp anything with, without an XT on the tricuspid side. And and if you can get a little bit wider, why not? Yeah. Yeah. I I would, uh, I would add that, uh, frankly, at least uh, many of the cases that we see here in the Pacific Northwest have such uh, long um, gaps or wide gaps, better to say, that they're, they're frankly hard to bridge. And even though there's some evidence uh, for some centers, apparently works to 
to do some external compression of the chest or do some other maneuvers to bring the leaflets closer together. Often I find the leaflets are long enough when we go by at least nine millimeter length and uh, it, it seems to be feasible to use the XTW. Uh, I'm not sure we get, we get um, as much of a grasp with the NT, if we just were to use the NTW only. I think we've done one case recently just to sort of explore where there was an XTW first and then an NTW sort of adjacent to it, just trying to see if that would help anchor or grip more tightly. Um, I don't know, it's too, too little um, an experience to really say much about it. Um, Burkhardt, what's on your sort of six month evolution? Well, on the one hand, going back to the, to the financial, meaning the justification and uh, playing by the book in terms of uh, who does the imaging and um, also make sure that, that the hospital actually recognizes the imager as an integral and essential part of the uh, interventional team and the heart valve team. Uh, so I think that's, that's one of the, 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 the focuses for me. And then embracing uh, up and coming new technology that we will have our hands on um, here momentarily. Uh, the, the devices have been, the, the platforms have been delivered. We just get them through uh, the biomed and, and then uh, explore new functionality of imaging and implement it uh, in our uh, routine case approach. That's it for me. Great. Amar, you, uh, any, any thoughts? Um, you know, I think, you know, sort of tying into my prior statement or my own sort of risk aversion, you know, with the tricuspid cases and sort of the, the points that you brought up and Mark about the SLD on the tricuspid side, I think I've, I've probably left behind tricuspid regurgitation in some patients that maybe I wished I'd put a, a second or a third clip, but I haven't for fear of dislodging what's already there and perhaps leaving a result that I'm hopeful they're gonna feel better with. Uh, and so I think, you know, just with, with doing more cases and having a better understanding, frankly, of when do I feel uncomfortable versus comfortable about going back in with a second or a third or a fourth device, uh, I think that's gonna be a, an important understanding. Cool. And Mark, any thoughts on your end? Yeah, just to add, um, you know, this is a, a slide that I, um, I don't know, I, hope, I think I'm still sharing. Yeah, you are. Which I thought was pretty cool. And, uh, you know, just learning the pathology of this and maybe we would change our approach, you know, this idea of, you know, the TR that's formed by uh, ventric ventricular, you know, pathology versus, you know, atrial pathology see a lot of this atriogenic TR and the leaflets, the annulus behave very differently than TR that's caused by pulmonary hypertension or, you know, other causes. And I, and I think this is a, just, I know it, it looks simple, but it's quite informative as we've gotten better also with, you know, understanding, you know, MR. So I think that's one thing, I think just understanding the, the pathology and interpreting, you know, what is actually where we are in the time course of it. Um, and as everybody on this call, I think we're really excited. Um, you know, the TriSend results have been nothing short of spectacular. Um, you know, Pascal TR is, is, you know, being used as well as Triluminate, uh, especially now Triluminate using the uh, G4 system. So that's obviously a, a great uh, opportunity. Uh, we're so comfortable with that device. It's like an extension of our arm at this point. And then there are several other uh, replacements and um, annular devices that are in development. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, you know, Rafi suggest, you know, sort of, you know, sort of, you know, just mentioned it, but you can't overstate how much better these patients feel when you make them better. It's quite remarkable. Um, you know, it's just a, a horrible disease, you know, the, the, you know, the, the lower extremity edema, the, the bloating, the fatigue. Um, if you turn these folks around, it's quite remarkable. So uh, probably one of the most rewarding, you know, procedures I've done, um, you know, as I've gone through my career. That's awesome. All right. Well, we're at time here. Um, 
And so first off, I just want to thank uh, all of our panel for for coming out and joining uh, last minute. Um, our participants for getting on and and listening to us uh, ramble and um, I've certainly learned a lot. I'm really thankful to have all you guys as as peers and colleagues and friends. Um, you you guys are making the news, not reading the news. So this is. Um, this is a big deal, and uh, and I appreciate uh, everyone's participation. So with that, I think we'll sign off. But thank you guys so much, and uh, thanks to our audience for joining. Great job, Jamie, and great to see everybody. Rafi, see you in a few months, thank right? Thank you. See you in a few months. All right. I'm, uh, I got the pizza in the oven. <laughs> uh, we have witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, my right, friend. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Take care.